I'll be the first one to admit, I am definitely a perfectionist. I don't just want to be a good wife or a good mom or a good Christian. I want to be a great wife, mom, and Christian. I want to do all the things, and I want to do them all really well. Well, if this is something that you can relate to as well, today's podcast is one that you won't want to miss. In it, we are talking with Colleen Carol Campbell, author of the book, The Heart of Perfection, How the Saints Taught Me to Trade My Dream of Perfect for God's. In this interview, I'm asking Colleen some tough questions. How can we be a great wife? How can we be a great mom and a great Christian without falling slave to these perfectionistic tendencies or feeling like we're constantly striving and never measuring up? So if this is something that you can relate to, you feel like you are always striving and never quite making it, this is one podcast episode you definitely won't want to miss. Today we're talking with Colleen Carol Campbell, author of the book, The Heart of Perfection, How the Saints Taught Me to Trade My Dream of Perfect for God's. Thank you so much for agreeing to talk with us today. Thank you so much for having me, Brittany. I appreciate it. Well, can you get us started just by telling us a little bit about your story and why this idea of perfectionism is so important to you? How has that um, played a role in your life? Well, I think I've always been a perfectionist, but I didn't always admit that. And it was really when I became a mother nine years ago when I had my twins. I have four kids ages nine down to five, but I I had two at once. And um, a lot of the habits and ways of thinking that I thought served me well, at least in my professional life and in other parts of life, when I imported them into motherhood, it was, uh, they didn't work so well. And I really realized through a series of things and in the heart of perfection, I opened the book with a story of my taking a toddler to the ER and recognizing that uh, perfectionism was a problem for me. And I began to look at the roots of it and discovered that it was rooted in something deeper than just what the world was telling me or maybe messages I had picked up in childhood that really at the heart of my struggle with perfectionism was a sense that I had to earn God's love. And of course, like any good Christian, I knew better than to say that out loud. I I knew I wasn't supposed to believe that because I think we all know intellectually that's not the case. But the more I looked at my own behavior and the way that I was looking at the world and the way that I was striving so hard in every part of my life um, and beating myself up so much when I failed, the more I realized perfectionism really was a problem for me. And then this book came about, The Heart of Perfection, because as I began to search for answers to that, to figure out what my faith had to say on this problem of perfectionism, I I found that um, a lot of what I was hearing was it just be good enough, you know, kind of drop trying to be excellent. You know, we don't need to worry about trying to grow really close to God or, or strive after holiness. We just need to kind of settle for what we've got. And, you know, if you're a true died in the wool perfectionist, that message doesn't really motivate you. It doesn't really resonate with you. And it didn't seem quite right to me. It seemed to me that there is something in us that longs for what is perfect. But the problem, of course, is that we define perfection differently than God does. And so I really embarked on this journey of trying to understand what is God's idea of perfect? How is it different from mine? And what does it take for me to move out of my own perfectionist mindset, which pretty much leads me to a spiritual dead end and dead end in every other way, and turn and begin to put on the eyes of Christ and to begin to see perfection the way he does and to long for what he longs for, for me, um, to, to strive for a different kind of perfect. And that's where this book, The Heart of Perfection, came from. Now, for me, I am someone who will 100% readily admit I am a perfectionist through and through. Um, I honestly have to admit I don't have a huge problem with this. I am proud to be a perfectionist. I'm sure I will feel differently by the end of our talk, Um, but that's just how I've always been. I'm someone who strives for excellence. I want to do the best. I want to be the best at everything. Um, So for me, this is something that I know, like as soon as I heard the topic of your book, okay, I need to read this. I need to dive into this. Um, I need to know what's going on. But um, I know for everyone in my audience listening, they might not all feel the same way. So I 
want you to just tell us a little bit more about this idea of perfectionism. Um, I've read a few different books about perfectionism, and it seems like everybody kind of defines it in a little bit of a different way. So for people who aren't like me, who are like, yep, that's me. Um, but for people who are like, okay, I'm not sure if this is something that I deal with or not. Like, what is what exactly are you talking about? Can you just give us a really good definition of what do you mean when you say someone who is a perfectionist? Well, it's interesting because perfectionism can be in different parts of your life. You could have maybe a totally sloppy house, but be a diehard spiritual perfectionist. Um, you, you could be a really hard uh, worker and a workaholic, but then in some other part of your life, you, you don't struggle with this at all. So uh, it can be different for each person, but I would say in general that it's this sense of an addiction to control, uh, to wanting a uh, flawlessness and expecting that in some part of life where it's either not possible or it's not possible right away the way you want it. Um, and the kind of perfectionism that I really focused on in the heart of perfection was spiritual perfectionism. The idea that we have all these other types that we talk about that are problems for us, but at the heart of almost all of them, if you look closely at them, and certainly for a believer, certainly for a Christian, is what is our view of God and God's view of us? What do we think uh, he's expecting of us? And um, spiritual perfectionism, I think, is the most dangerous kind of perfectionism, partly because it's well hidden, partly because most of us won't admit we actually have it, or we look at it as a virtue in a sense. You know, yeah, I'm striving to be holy. I'm striving to be more like God. Isn't that what I'm supposed to do? Well, that's not necessarily a bad thing. And actually, um, a big part of the heart of perfection for me was digging into scripture and looking at what scripture actually said about perfection, but also looking at saints down through the ages who have struggled with this and finding out that many of the very saints that I once thought were encouraging me to be more of a spiritual perfectionist, you know, uh, to, to strive harder and harder and beat myself up harder when I messed up, when I, when I fell into the same sins and faults and flaws that I have for years, uh, those same saints, many of them were actually themselves recovering perfectionists. And I was surprised to discover that it wasn't perfectionist striving that had brought them closer to God, it was when they let that go. And when they began to seek healing for their spiritual perfectionism and to rest more deeply in grace, none of which involved giving up their desire for excellence, um, kind of slacking off in the spiritual life, which frankly is what I thought it might mean to recover from perfectionism. I mean, you just settle for mediocrity. But the saints that I looked at, um, these recovering perfectionist saints were anything but mediocre. They became more and more themselves and they accomplished wonderful, amazing things for God. But those things were accomplished after they began the struggle to let go of their own ideas of perfect and take on God's. So that was the important turning point for them. And so I began to look at those stories and I thought, you know, these stories are so instructive. And even though some of these folks, I'm talking people like Benedict of Nursia who lived in the you know 400s, they still have something to say to us today. And certainly when combined with scripture, when we look at what scripture says about perfection, there's a lot here that we can dig into no matter where we're coming from, no matter which part of our life we struggle with perfectionism. Because if you look at any part of your life where you're struggling with that addiction to control and to impossible expectations, probably there's a spiritual root there that needs to be addressed. So I'm really glad that you mentioned this idea of um, recovering from spiritual perfectionism doesn't have to mean settling for mediocre. Because for me, that it really is how you said it's not going to resonate with um, perfectionists. That does not resonate with me at all. Like I always have the um, sentiment or the feeling of shouldn't we do our best and shouldn't we, you know, be good stewards of everything God has given us. And if we have the capability of doing all the things, shouldn't we be doing all all of the things. Um, and that's honestly like just where I come at it from. If I can be a mom, I should be the best mom. And if I can be a wife, I should be the best wife. And I should run Equipping Godly Women so well because, you know, why would I do any less than everything? So can you just unpack a little bit more for us of why that would be a bad thing? Why shouldn't we try to be the best mom and try to be the best wife and in, in whatever area, because we all deal with different areas of our lives, but why shouldn't we, or maybe we should, but how does, how does that play out? Right. So that's a great question. And I don't think that uh, either the saints or scripture, or, or certainly not my experience, 
tell us that we need to let go of that. In fact, that's what we're hearing more and more from our culture. Ah, oh, let it go. Good enough. Hey, you're you're enough just the way you are. Actually, we're not enough the way we are. That's why we're Christians, because we know we need Jesus, because doing it our own way, on our own power, on the strength of our own virtues, it's just not going to get us there. And we know that. Uh, and as Christians, that's really a central truth of our faith. So uh, the idea is not letting go of excellence. In fact, I would argue that was put in your heart and in mine by God himself. That's our longing for perfection. That's our longing for heaven. I mean, to squelch that is to squelch who we are as human beings made in the image of an all-perfect, all-powerful, beautiful God. But I think where we start to get into trouble is when the striving replaces the receiving of the grace. And this is not about sitting back and hoping God just does everything for me because I'm not going to even try. It's not about that at all. But it is about this sense that this is not all powered by me and my willpower. It's also a lot about surrender. And that means for most perfectionists and for most women who are busy with whatever they're doing in the community, any work that they're doing, and certainly with their children and their families, allowing God to set the agenda every day through prayer, through spending time with his word, but especially when we look at this list of all these things we want to do for God, and there's so much we want to do, but that's where I think we can get ourselves in real trouble. That sense of overcommitment of it's all riding on me. That's very much a perfectionist impulse, and it doesn't necessarily come from a bad place, but it can lead us to a bad place if we're not willing to step back, to let go a little, to ask Jesus every day, do you want me to take on all of this? Is there somewhere here in all this mix of things where I can let something go? And a lot of times if we look deeply into our lives and into some of those struggles, at least for me, I can admit that I see that it's not all about glorifying God. A lot of it is, and it starts there, but it starts to kind of become about glorifying myself and not embarrassing myself and wanting what I do to look really good. And there are times when I can't do that and also do the other things God is calling me to right now in this moment. So I have to make a choice. And that's where letting go of the world's idea of perfection, even the world's idea of spiritual perfection, which looks, you know, perfect. Steel Magnolia smiles for every trial and, you know, amazing blasts of inspiration at every prayer time and a million service projects and, and time for everybody. Sometimes we have to put that aside and say, Jesus, is that what you want for me today? Or do you actually want me to rest a bit with you? You want me to spend more time with you? Is there a, someone in my own home who needs more of me while I'm running around doing all of these other things? So I don't think it's an either or, but I do think it is, again, always going back to that idea of there's our idea of what God wants us to do. And then there's this freedom to bring that agenda every day to Jesus, lay it at his feet and say, is, there, is this really your call for me? Or is there something else here driving me? People pleasing, pride, fear of not being worthy, whatever it is. And I give that back to you. And I'm willing to look like less in the eyes of the world if that's what it takes to grow closer to you and your idea of perfect for me. That makes so much sense. And I'm so glad I'm just like processing in my head because that is honestly really helpful to me. Um, but can you share and just dive in a little deeper even of, okay, so when we're in this season where we are just striving to be the best or do all the things, we want to be a great mom, we want to be a great wife. Um, and those things aren't necessarily bad, but where is the line? This is my biggest question. Where is the line or how do we know um, if we're kind of in the territory where we really are just trying to be good Christians and good stewards and we're doing the right thing and when we've gotten off track and we are starting to do it for the wrong reasons and we're getting into that spiritual perfectionistic way of being how can we kind of tell because on a day-to-day -day basis you know maybe we're not doing wrong things maybe we're really making our bible a priority or we're really trying to do good things for our kids but how can we really figure out um how we're doing in this area well that's a great question um you know i think one thing that i found really helpful was the discernment rules that were created by uh, saint saint ignatius and he based these off scripture they're full of scripture every line has a quote from scripture and he was basically trying to answer that question because he had struggled he was a very talented and driven person who had a big conversion and as soon as he had it he just wanted to go out and take on the world for christ which is a great idea but he started to run into some troubles he got very discouraged at one point i mean almost to the 
to the point of wanting to to no longer live because he was so uh, racked with guilt over past sins. He was so frustrated at his own weakness. Uh, there were other times when he got so many amazing ideas all at once he couldn't sleep and then he'd wake up the next morning and couldn't do the things he had to do for God that he had committed to do because he'd laid awake all night contemplating the beauty of God and his amazing virtues. So he was, he was struggling with some of these things and he came out with these discernment rules, which I found really helpful. One of them that is especially, it's very subtle, but if you practice it over time, I think it will start to make sense to you. This is always in the context, of course, of prayer and being in the word every day and looking at um, sitting kind of with our feelings sometimes, that sense of drivenness that sometimes a perfectionist get, I can speak for myself at least, and Ignatius certainly described this, this sense of I have to do this thing right now, just the right way, and I have to deal with it right now, and it can't wait, and I can't process it, and I can't think about it, I've got to get out there and do it. Um, as soon as we start feeling that, you know, that sense of, I guess you would say it's a loss of freedom. It, it's a compulsion. And it could be a compulsion to do this great, wonderful thing. But when you start to feel that sense of compulsion, that sense of urgency that isn't actually urgent, it's not a kid's falling out of a tree, I gotta run, catch him. It's this urgent, compulsive kind of drivenness. I think as we begin to watch for that and pray through those feelings, we can start to see them popping up and say, you know what, I don't know if that's of God. Because we know that fear is not of God. We know, um, drivenness and urgency over things that may not actually be urgent, that's not of God. Um, we know panic over how things are going to turn out if we don't take control right now and do it our very best. That's not of God. And it takes time to begin to recognize those things. And again, it always comes back to prayer, to sitting with prayer. But I think that's one thing we can do too when we look at our overstuffed schedules, you know, because there's always this feeling, at least I've struggled with it, that the nice Christian thing to do is to say yes, right? When they ask you to help with that, with the bake sale, when they ask you to run this, when they ask you, could you please do this one extra thing, you should be a good giving Christian and say yes. But it's interesting because Ignatius talks about how sometimes the evil one uses good ideas and he's happy to use those if those can pull us off the track of peace. Um, we want to always preserve our peace and I think that's an important marker to always step back and say, do I really have my peace with Christ right now or am I losing my peace over this? And if I'm losing my peace over it, uh, if, if it's not a true emergency, then I need to step back, take a few, few breaths and make sure that I'm allowing God to set my agenda. And some of this is just admitting we're weaker and we have more limits and more time constraints than we'd like to admit. Admitting, in other words, that we're not God. So I love how you talk about the saints in your book, because honestly, I have not yet read a lot about the saints. It's definitely on my to-do list, um, but it's something I haven't had enough chance to really dive into yet. Um, but as I'm reading your book and as I'm reading these stories, they're just really come to life and are really interesting um, just how applicable they are to us today. But I wanted to ask you, of all the saints that you researched and wrote about in this book or maybe just researched, um, were there any stories that really stuck out to you or really any insights that you were like, that is so good um, that you might want to share with us? Oh, there were so many. And I, I really uh, got to know some of these saints who I didn't know as well before researching the heart of perfection. Uh, one that jumps out at me is Saint Frank, uh, Jane de Chantal. She was a French woman, um, lived hundreds of years ago, but interesting life because so many of her struggles, I think, would be familiar to a lot of women today. Her husband was killed in a hunting accident when she had just had uh, their fourth child. So she had four children, I think like six and under, when her husband uh, was killed. So she was a widow. They were wealthy, but she had to manage this whole estate by herself. She had this crew of in-laws that you couldn't believe. I mean, you couldn't make this stuff up, how horrible they were to her. And then they were trying to take over the estate and steal her children's inheritance. So she was managing these crazy in-laws. She was running this estate. She was raising four kids, six and under. And she was a perfectionist, a spiritual perfectionist who was waking you know at at awful hours so that she could have hours and hours to pray she was she was riding nine miles to church uh, each day each way 
Um, she was a very intense person and she had come under the influence of a spiritual director who had encouraged this and kind of, you got to work harder, harder, harder. She was pushing herself so hard that she was basically at the brink of exhaustion and she was beginning to doubt her faith, beginning to lose hope and, and to lose her faith in Christ because she was trying so hard to do everything she thought he was asking her to do and she was about to crack. And right around that time, she met another saint, Francis de Sales, who himself had struggled with perfectionism in college. And he convinced her that God was not calling her to do all these things she thought she had to do. She did have a lot to do. He was calling her to a busy life, no doubt. But he was calling her first and foremost to be gentler with herself because he could see that she was hard on her kids. She was hard on her employees. She was, she was driven crazy by these in-laws. But he said, you know, it all stems from how hard you are on yourself because that's how you think God is looking at you with judgment, judgment, judgment. And he's not. And he's told her something. Um, he has a great quote. He says, have patience with everyone, but above all with yourself. And we can hear that in today's context and think, oh boy, there we go. You know, just cut yourself lots of slack, do whatever you want. That wasn't what he was saying at all. And if you look at his advice to her, it was a lot of things like, hey, don't starve yourself when you're a, a young single mother who needs to run around all day. You, you can't be doing these penances where you're not barely eating. But why don't you choose not to eat your favorite food for a while? Or why don't you choose to be patient to the next person who interrupts you? That's actually a tougher sacrifice. That's actually a greater gift to God than running around taking on more projects. Why don't you be present to the children in front of you and do your best to be patient when disciplining these really difficult children sometimes? So he had all of these very, um, I would say, common sense insights into how we grow in holiness and we grow closer to God not necessarily by running out everywhere to find new amazing things to do for him, but sometimes just settling in and learning gentleness and patience with others. And that has to begin by accepting that mercy that he has for ourselves. Because when we begin to be gentle with ourselves, we're able to be gentler to others. And then that gentleness introduces a whole level of peace into the world that we can't introduce when we're running around just being part of the chaos, part of the harshness, part of the hurry. And all of that resonated with me because I'm someone who feels I'm always late and I tend to be harsh when I'm stressed. Uh, certainly, you know, when you're dealing with little kids and we got to go, we got to go. You know, just that sense of this woman who started that way and was was about as driven as you get. And by the end of her life, People were coming to her from hundreds of miles away to seek her spiritual counsel, and she was known as a paragon of gentleness, a woman who really exuded the gentleness of Christ, the gentleness she had learned at his feet through prayer, but also through practicing it on herself, her children, and those immediately around her, more than on running out to find new projects. That is really interesting to me just because I can really relate to that as well. Um, and it just reminded me of something else I had heard and I don't remember where it was from. Um, I really wish I could give credit because it's not for me. Um, but somebody somewhere said something to the effect of God is less interested in what you can do for him and more interested in who you are. Um, and that's something that I've always just really tried to keep in mind. Like if God needed something done, he created the entire <laughs> universe in seven days. He can get things, or six days actually. Um, God can get things done. He right. doesn't need people to get things done. Like he allows us to help, yes. but he doesn't need our help. Like he doesn't, you know, it's not on me to do the things. He does, like he could snap his fingers, it's done. Um, but he cares so much more about who we are being and um, giving us an you know, I don't have Bible verses to back all of this up, but it's just something I always try to keep in mind. Um, maybe he's not giving us these things, whether it's um, being a wife or taking care of our kids or cleaning the house or running companies or whatever we're doing. Maybe he's not giving us these things because he needs somebody to do them because <laughs> right. uh, he could do them. Um, but maybe he's giving us these things because through the process of doing them, um, it refines who we are and our character and teaches us, okay, here's Here's some kids because you need to learn how to be patient. And kids will do that to you. Um, they force you to learn some patience. Um, so that's just something that I really, for myself, do a horrible good job of, but try to keep in mind. Um, but I wanted to ask you, um, for those of us who are either like totally know we're perfectionists or are realizing, okay, maybe I've been striving really hard to do all the things because you get on Instagram and you get on Facebook and you see your friends and you go to church and you're like, I have to do all of the things. Um, 
for somebody like me, like you, who's in this situation where they're like, okay, I know I've been trying really hard to do all of the things. I'm feeling totally burnt out. I can't keep up. What are the first steps? How do we even get started overcoming this? Well, I, I know one beautiful place to start. And one thing I was blessed to do when researching the heart of perfection is to really dig into scripture and see what God does have to say about perfection uh, in scripture, in his word. Um, every chapter in the heart of perfection begins with uh, a scripture about perfection. And these are ones that I chose because I found it so interesting how God defines perfection and, and where he situates it. You know, when he's talking about being perfect, He's talking about things like forgiving others, even those who hurt us, kind of keeping our hearts wide open. He's he's talking about love as the bond of perfection. So that one thing, always going back to the word, is a way that we can really see what does God have to say about perfection. Um, obviously, prayer too. And then I think we do need to think about this idea of resting in his grace and being gentle with ourselves. Again, this is not about slacking off. This isn't about self-indulgence. Sometimes this is actually very hard to say, I'm going to let that thing go and I'm going to let other people think I just couldn't handle it because, you know, I, I don't care. I, God has told me that he needs me to take a few things off my plate. Or you know what? I just messed that up for the fourth time today. And I'm going to go over there and apologize again, even though it's embarrassing and humbling and I'm tired of this flaw of mine. I'm going to accept that. And I think what you said earlier is so interesting because you know, we know, uh, St. Paul says that when we are weak, we are strong, right? Christ is strong in us. And I think a lot of times these flaws, these shortcomings, these time constraints, these things that drive us crazy, especially as perfectionists about ourselves or our lives, we think, why doesn't God just fix this and remove this already? I've prayed about this. But a lot of the saints said, you know, that's the very thing that's keeping you leaning on his grace. That's the thing that's reminding you every day that you need him. And if you just had that thing licked, you might forget. You might be tempted to think you're the one driving the car. You're the one in control. So a lot of times what's on the top of our list of spiritual pet peeves isn't a big concern to God. He's actually worried about some other things. And I think above all, we just need to keep in mind his grace and his love and how it's not a cheap grace. It's not about, I don't have to do anything. I just sit back and God will take care of it. It's about trusting though, that he really is in control. And that, as you said, he can get his work done either way. And it's a privilege and it's a joy to do his work for him. But it's also a joy sometimes just to spend time with him, to rest in him. We're in a culture full of noise, full of frenetic activity, full of social media screaming at us from every angle. It's, it's a beautiful thing when we can just stop and say, I'm tuning it all out and I'm spending time with Jesus. And then I'm turning to my loved ones. I'm turning off the phone and I'm just going to spend time with them. Think of the people you know in your life who've changed your life. It probably wasn't because of what they did. But like you said, it was because of who they were. And they have to be filled up by Jesus first before they can be that for others. And I think that's a good place for us to start. I love that. And I love how you were talking earlier about just being willing to start your day and just laying it all at the feet of Jesus and saying, okay, God, what do you want um, for me to do today? Because I know even for myself that it's so tempting to, I always start every day with here's my to-do list. And if things don't go as planned, if I have a little one who recently gave up naps and it's driving oh, me crazy, yeah, that's the worst. <laughs> we're just at that age and that's just what it is. But it's like, I have my list and I want to power through and I want to be like, no, we're going to do all the things. And I don't care if I have to yell at all the kids <laughs> right. and whatever, because it's, you know, we get so caught up in the things that we think we need to do on our to-do list and we get so caught up in the things that other people like the marks of being a good Christian or a good wife or like I need to do these things when we are neglecting the things we actually need to do um, and I know that that's a big like signal to me like okay am I so focused on I have to do these things that I'm neglecting to love my children well that I'm neglecting to spend time with my family and my husband um, so I love especially how you said to, you know, just start each day, not saying you're not going to do anything, not saying you're not going to, you know, do things, but okay, what do you want me to do today, God? And being willing to hold your agenda loosely and to say, okay, this is, you know, what I think, but you know, what do you want me to do? And if things are 
interruptions, then yes, give me open eyes and open ears so that I notice the things that are of you and that I'm willing, you know, whatever else, let's put that aside and, you know, let's just do whatever God has for us today. I love that. Um, another thing I wanted to ask you about is, okay, now that we have our first steps, here's how we can get started. Um, as we are on this journey and we are learning to hold things a little more loosely to seek God's will and to do what he wants for us to do rather than our own perfectionism, um, are there any really common pitfalls along the way that we should know is common to pop up that we should watch out for? There are, and I, I talk in more depth about this in The Heart of Perfection, but I would say one important one for perfectionists that I don't think I realized was a problem for me as much until I started researching this book is discouragement. Um, we get discouraged, yes, at what we can't do, what we can't accomplish, but as we move further on this journey, sometimes we also get discouraged at this this drivenness that we keep seeing in ourselves. Oh, no, I did it again. I made that to-do list and ran off. And, oh, I snapped at the kids. I, you know, And I think that's a lot of the times that's where the devil really gets us in terms of getting us off track is then we go into this perfectionist uh, self-punishment cycle. You know, now I am going to be judge and jury and executioner for myself. It's almost the sense of if I do it, then God won't bother because I've beaten myself up enough, right? And um, we can get very wrapped up in that and we can think that it's justified. Hey, I'm recognizing my sin. I'm calling it out. Well, it's good to recognize sin. Absolutely. It's good to say we're sorry immediately to God and to the person we offended. Absolutely. But at the same time, we want to be careful and not to allow that to become another form of self-absorption. St. Francis de Sales said to Jane de Chantal when she was in this kind of cycle, he said, you know, you may think that's glorifying God, but in a sense, you're kind of just focusing on yourself, right? You're focusing on your flaw and why can't I fix this flaw? And I'm so angry about why do I keep doing this? Or I just get sad about it and I just want to give up. All of that, all of that kind of giving up as soon as we recognize what's weak and fallen in ourselves is a form of pride. It's a form of saying, well, if I'm not God and I'm not perfect yet, then I don't want to keep trying, you know, and and really, I mean, that's all that's all about distraction. And it's all back to focusing on ourselves when really, again, we just keep our eyes on Christ and we get a lot further in the spiritual life. Francis de Sales says we're going to grow a lot more in holiness if we focus on God rather than focusing on our sin. We admit our sin. We say we're sorry for our sin, but that's not where the focus is. The focus is always back to Jesus. And that's how we're also going to grow in humility. And we're going to focus on that one thing necessary, right, as Jesus told Martha. And the one thing necessary is Jesus. So keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus, the perfecter of our faith, as scripture tells us, is so important, more important uh, than fixating on this is a habitual sin of mine and I just have to really watch myself. You know, we don't have to police ourselves. We have to keep turning it over to Jesus. And in some ways that's harder. And at the same time, we still have to be willing to admit it's sin. It's a very difficult balancing act, but with grace, it becomes uh, an easier thing. It can even become a joy. That is such good advice. I'm just soaking this all up and like the wheels are turning in my head as I'm figuring Great. out how I'm going to apply all this. Um, but before we wrap things up today, I just want to ask you one last question. And that is if you could give one piece of advice, like one insight, um, boil it all down to somebody who is in this situation, what one piece of advice would you give? I think the thing that I would say, and I, I, one reason I would say this is because I concluded The Heart of Perfection with a chapter on this. So I think it's it, it struck me as very important. And that is when I look at all of this, how am I going to come over, get over this? How am I going to adopt that habit? How am I going to let go of that habit? It starts to feel really overwhelming. And, and most of all, how do I forgive myself and others for mistakes I've made before, for you know things that others have done that seem to have pushed me in this direction? And I kept coming back to something. I noticed how almost every saint that I profiled in the heart of perfection in one time or another had a real focus on the heart of Jesus, the heart of Christ. They did this in different ways in their writing, in their devotion, in the scriptures they were attracted to. But they had this real focus on the heart of Jesus and most of them also explicitly on taking on the heart of Jesus. In other words, thinking more and more, not how am I going to love that person? How am I going to forgive that person? How am I going to heal myself of these perfectionist compulsions? But more and more saying, open my heart, Lord, and give me your heart. 
let's trade hearts in a sense, right? Because Jesus doesn't want to do a heart repair surgery on us. He wants a heart transplant. He wants us to love with his heart. And when he talks about being perfect as God is perfect, he's talking about being forgiving and loving as God is. We can't do that on our own strength. We can't do that with our fallen human hearts. But we can ask Jesus to fill us with his love, to love others with his heart. And that's a prayer that more and more I've thought about and made as I've seen how many recovering perfectionist saints were in the same boat as me. And it was really when they saw themselves as asking Jesus to just take over, take over their heart, take over their lives so that they were not in control anymore. When they were surrendering to his heart, they really began to see progress. So I'm still a work in progress. I'm still working on this, but um, I think that's a really beautiful place to start. Yeah, I love that. Well, that is about all we have time for today. But thank you so much for agreeing to come on and share these insights with us and just to have this conversation. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed it. All right. So that just about does it for today. If you enjoyed today's podcast, you find yourself really resonating with some of the stories that we shared. And you are also someone who can be a bit of a perfectionist or really hard on yourself um, and feeling like you have a really high standard, which is not always a bad thing. I am the same way. Um, but if you'd like to learn even more about this topic, I would absolutely recommend for you to check out Colleen's book, the Heart of Perfection, How the Saints Taught Me to Trade My Dream of Perfect for Gods. So definitely go ahead, check out the show notes. I will link um, links for where you can find this book as well as any other links that might be useful for you as well. So definitely go ahead and check those out. And as always, if you have not subscribed to this channel yet, what are you waiting for? Um, I come back all the time with great interviews and talks on all of the issues that Christian women deal with every day as we try to be these excellent Christian wives and mothers or whatever it is that God is calling us to today. So definitely go ahead if you, and subscribe if you have not already. Check out the show notes for even more great information and I will see you back here real soon. All right, bye.